we were able to collect brine samples on surface at Urgatnaran of up to 918 milligrams per liter. Of course, that was exciting to us and to everybody that was on site that had had experience around the world looking for lithium. And so we devised a, uh, a TEM, geophysics program across the entire asset. That was 100 line kilometers. It showed us a low resistivity zone of 22.7 billion cubic meters of brine. Hello, welcome to Assay TV. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Ali Haji, who is CEO and Director of Iron Energy, Mongolia's first lithium brine developer and explorer. Ali, fantastic to see you today. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, if we could start things off with a quick um, recap on Iron Energy and your two projects there in Mongolia, the brine projects at Ugak Naran and Bavai Ul. Absolutely. Thank you, Leo. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, for our new listeners, Ion Energy is a company that I co-founded in 2017 uh, with the sole focus of looking for lithium in Mongolia. Uh, we went public in August 2020 at a time when the entire world was uh, essentially under lockdown and we didn't have access to country. Uh, based on Bavayul, our flagship large asset in Sukhbatar province, it's uh, 81,000 hectares located 23 kilometers from the Chinese border. Uh, we went public on that asset. We were able to do some work on it, very minimal, considering the fact that we are first movers in Mongolia and the necessary skill set to advance a lithium asset did not exist in country. Uh, we were able to complete a number of auger holes, 222 to be precise, to better, to better understand this behemoth of a license. And it is 60 kilometers wide by about 20 kilometers tall. So roughly about five times the size of the city of Vancouver, uh, for, for comparison's sake. The 222 holes that we completed showed us uh, a high grade anomaly of up to 1502 pp ppm lithium at the White Wolf prospect. And that's twice, almost twice, I should say, the 811 ppm that we saw at the asset before we went public. So rather encouraging result there. We also found some very good copper and nickel uh, anomalies on that asset, which have yet to be explored. And then last year, if our, our listeners recall, we completed a bought deal from PI Financial and Stiefel GMP, but we also acquired Urgach Naran, which is our secondary asset in Dorn Govi province, 29,000 hectares in a closed basin with fault bound, very similar geologically to what you can expect to find in, say, the Atacama, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina. So very, uh, very similar to the regions that you find uh, existing Solaris today. Uh, we had an opportunity last year after having completed the bought deal to work with our technical team, which includes Don Haynes, an individual that's worked various lithium projects around the world, and Dr. Mark King, who is the qualified person at Neo Lithium when it sold to Zijin uh, last year for about $920 million. So we planned an exploration program uh, on Urgat Naran, went out to country in April of this year for the very first time since having taken the company public. And we were able to collect brine samples on surface at Urgat Naran of up to 918 milligrams per liter. Of course, that was exciting to us and to everybody that was on site that had had experience around the world looking for lithium. And so we devised a, uh, a TEM, geophysics program across the entire asset. That was 100 line kilometers. It showed us a low resistivity zone of 22.7 billion cubic meters of brine at a cutoff at about six and a half ohm, which for uh, those that are following uh, similar news releases from some of our peers, uh, generally the cutoff is seven ohms. So six and a half being rather conservative, 22.7 billion cubic meters uh, seen there. At half an ohm uh, cutoff, 9.9 .9 billion cubic meters uh, being seen there as well. And those numbers are significant for our viewers to, to understand because if you have an asset with 9.9 .9 billion cubic meters and an average rate of 100 milligrams per liter, that's an inferred resource of close to 10 million ton LCE. And that justifies the necessary capex to bring such a project into production. So that got us excited. Uh, that ultimately led to our drilling program, which uh, consisted, of course, of three uh, lithological holes using diamond core drilling down to a maximum or total depth, I should say, of 954 meters. We've also stepped out 10 meters from each of those holes to drill water wells, so hydro hydrogeological wells, to allow us to collect brine samples once those are complete. And I think that, Leo, uh, brings us to, to sort of the crux of the press release that we put out uh, sort of here in the last week. Absolutely. So you've you've put out you've done these uh, three holes, drilled these three holes, and you've just put out this press release uh, showing the results. So, big question: What have you found in those three holes? We've seen some pretty interesting intercepts, and uh, some of those include at UNDH01, 123 meters at 278 ppm lithium from 122 meters, with a maximum grade at that hole reported 832 ppm. 
At UNDH02, we had 100 meters at 362 ppm, uh, lithium from 65 meters with a maximum lithium grade of 601 ppm. Uh, and then at UNDH03, we had 71.4 meters at 360 ppm lithium from 3.6 meters with a maximum lithium at 911 ppm. Mm. And those numbers are significant because they are relatively high grade considering how close they are from surface. And if our viewers were to look at apples to apples as a comparison, uh, Albemarle Silver Peak Mine in Nevada is the only brine producing asset in North America today. And their average lithological grades when they completed their drilling program on that asset was 121 ppm. And so when we're seeing an average grade of well over 300 across our three holes that are about uh, anywhere between three and five kilometers apart across this significant basin uh, that spans, of course, we've talked about 9.9 .9 billion cubic meters at half an ohm or 22.7 billion cubic meters at six and a half ohm. The next step in the process would be obtaining the brine samples from those hydrogeological wells calculating an average grade across those brine columns, and then inferring a resource on what's looking very exciting thus far to be um, something that could potentially come uh, to commercial production. Mm. I mean, how does the size of this, this project compare uh, with Bavayul? Bavayul is uh, roughly three times the size of Urgak Naran. Uh, Baba Yul is, is a project, as I said, we didn't have much time to work on because we went public at the height of the pandemic, but we did scratch the surface and it is exciting. Urgak Naran checked all the boxes with respect to the geological structure being very similar uh, to that of what you can expect to find at any producing salar or, or a salar that's under exploration um, in the Americas. And so we focused our attention there, given it was a smaller uh, footprint. Uh, with a lot of potential and we were able to get the team out there to get the necessary work done that would replicate or mirror uh, the various standards of exploration that are being used in regions that currently show uh, promise for solars or are producing uh, lithium from those various solars. Mm. So you've, you've just um, you've been drilling these uh, hydrological test wells as well as you mentioned nearby. Um, what's the progress on that? They, they consist of a, a tricone bit drilling program that goes uh, you know, at similar depths as the uh, uh, lithological holes that have been completed. There's a, it's a, stem, a 10 meter step out from where the, the lithological holes have been drilled. We have four inch steel, stainless steel casing, slotted pipes that go down all the way to the bottom. They're gravel packed, to allowing the, uh, the brine to flow in. We've now completed two and a half of those holes, the third of which should be completed in the coming weeks here. We've ordered various uh, pieces of equipment from Solenst here in Canada that we've shipped over, including balers, uh, tapes, and uh, various sounding devices that will measure things such as total dissolved solids, as well as get a sense of the grade of those brines from those various, or encapsulated uh, samples of brine from various depth that, that we would then submit to SGS in country in Mongolia for assaying. And then that, in, in fact, will allow us to understand the average grade across the column of brine allowing us to move forward towards uh, inferred resource. So that's where we are with those hydrogeological wells. Uh, are, you, you can imagine that Mongolia is rather cold uh, at this time of the year. And this is a rather sensitive process where you have to go in and, and be very meticulous with your, your collection of those brine samples. And so the company has opted to wait until the first week of March before deploying that equipment and a team uh, for us to collect those brine samples. But the third uh, hydrogeological well uh, should be well completed by then. And I used well twice in a sentence there, but that's all right. Hmm. I mean, it's a, as you mentioned, you're the first people in Mongolia. Um, what, what, is, what is your feeling about the sort of potential of Mongolia as a future major lithium producer? Well, we think it's rather strong. I think if you look at the geological formations across uh, Mongolia, you know, it's, it's a vast country. It's a million and a half square kilometers. Um, if you look in the north, there's a lot of uh, tundra forests, uh, very similar to what you can expect to see in Siberia. In the western part of the country, there's mountain ranges. Uh, that have been there for you know millions of years and, and have uh, been erected as a result of uh, plate uh, tectonics. And then in the south, you have uh, the Gobi Desert. And to the east, you have the plateau, uh, so the steppe in essence. And Mongolia lies in the great Asian Endoheric Basin, uh, which is indicative of what you would expect to find in, in Latam, where these lithium deposits exist today. Uh, if you also look across the border in China, about 1,500 kilometers southwest of where we're located, uh, the Qinghai brines are in production there, and those are generally low-grade, high-impurity uh, brines, and, and they have been brought to production. Now, whether they end up in electric vehicles, you know, they may have a few steps of refinement associated with them, uh, but they do ultimately end up in, in rechargeable batteries for 
uh, things that you may, may buy on Amazon. Uh, but what we're seeing at Urgach Naran currently is that the impurity ratios, so the sodium, the potassium, the magnesium, the calcium, and the boron uh, ratios are rel- significantly lower, I should say, than what, we're, what has been seen at Qinghai. And the grades thus far on our lithological holes, of course, <clears throat> very encouraging. One other thing of note that I think uh, uh, should be uh, said to our viewers and our listeners is if you look at some of the brine assets in the Americas, uh, you know, operating in Alberta with oil sands and and, and various other types in, in the UK as well, uh, where, where you found uh, brine at depth, you know, th- those samples or, or those brine bodies are at anywhere between 1800 and 2600 meters below surface. And that, of course, adds to your cost of pumping up the brine, processing it. And if you're using DLE, of course, putting that brine back in the aquifer. Our brines thus far have been shown based on our TEM to be very shallow. And so that gives us promise as to what is on surface. But through the lithological drilling that we've now completed, we still haven't hit base basement. So we haven't hit the ground rock yet. We, we believe there's still potential for us to understand what's beneath this existing aquifer. And once we have the ability to, to define an inferred resource, potentially fund the company through a strategic investment validating the work that we've done and proving in fact that Mongolia is a jurisdiction in which you can find lithium as per what we're telling the market, we will more than likely employ uh, seismic uh, to better understand what's at depth and, and should there be an aquifer beneath that, of course, something we would look to explore as well. Mm. So in terms of moving this project forward to production, have you got any thoughts on, on how you would go about producing it, whether it be direct lithium extraction or, or, or having large uh, ponds? It's a good question. So if you look at uh, Albemarle Silver Peak mine today in Nevada, that's at 1300 meters above sea level. Um, at Urgach Naran, we're about 1000 meters above sea level. At uh, Albemarle Silver Peak mine, they have about an 18 month evaporation cycle. Of course, uh, one can imagine that evaporation ponds take a significant amount of land uh, out of use, uh, but they also deplete the underlying water table, uh, thereby, of course, causing structural issues in the ground uh, as you start to, to, to take out more and more water. Uh, for Ion, uh, where Urgach Naran is today, uh, we're in Mongolia. It's a sparsely populated nation, but it does consist of nomadic pastoralists, individuals that herd livestock that required the necessary land for, for you know, their, their, their goats, their camels, their horses, whatever it may be, uh, to, to uh, receive sustenance, be it from the, the salt, uh, salt lakes that provide them with the necessary minerals, or be it from the grasslands that grow in, in, the, in the vicinity as well. So our goal and, and our view has always been to evaluate uh, DLE solutions. We've spoken with DLE partners in Europe, in Asia, in uh, Eurasia, I should say, as well as um, in the US and Canada. So we've spoken with individuals. We have a plan to pr- uh, provide them with uh, various uh, um, brine samples once we have them out of our water wells so they can run them through their laboratories. Of course, your footprint is significantly smaller, so you're allowing that lifestyle and that that that, uh, that way of life to continue. And importantly, um, Urgat Naran, at the bottom of our basin, we're located about seven kilometers from Delgare Sum. And Delgare Sum is a community that is connected to the national grid, so you would be able to use electricity. We're in a region with very high winds and, and 250 days of sunshine, so you could have the potential uh, very well to move this thing to a carbon neutral producing facility, producing 99.9% pure lithium carbonate. So DLE is absolutely top of mind. Uh, and the partners that we work with and speak with um, from a strategic perspective have that view as well. Okay, so what are the plans for 2023? 2023 will include, of course, completing the hydrogeological wells and then ultimately deploying the team uh, to allow them to collect those brine samples to move towards an inferred resource. Uh, we would hope to get that done in H1 of next year, should it happen sooner, of course, the market will be first to know. Uh, but in H1, we'd like to do um, inferred resource, move towards measured and indicated. But we continue to have conversations with strategics as well. So the goal of the strategic conversations, as I mentioned, is to validate the work that we've done. But we're also a very strong exploration team. Uh, you know, part of the team built Lithium Americas, they built Neolithium, uh, but, but brought them to essentially a, a strong sort of exploration footing whereby they could have gone on to development and production. So the skill set that the company currently is looking to fill through strategic investment is that skill set that allows us to better understand how to develop and ultimately bring these assets to production or look for the ultimate partner that would consider uh, taking us out entirely in a buyout. Excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, for giving us that update on the company and best of luck as you move forward into 2023 uh, as pioneers of lithium brines in Mongolia. But thank you very much for joining us today on Assay TV. Thank you, Leo.